from Foxa. Connie, explain to our listening audience exactly what that is. Well, it's not the good-looking guy sitting beside you. Uh, yeah, I think you're right. Since <laughs> <laughs> so there isn't one. <laughs> there you go. Okay. Foxa stands for Family and Friends Fighting Against Child Sexual Assault. Uh, we're from Louisiana. We're 501c3 status. We're an all-volunteer staff. Uh, what we do on a local level is get pro bono attorneys and counselors for children of child sexual assault and their families. We give them the guidance and resources they need to make it through the process, uh, go to court with them, um, just mentorship, whatever they need. Uh, we also conduct a lot of community education and prevention, as you can tell with the Shattering the Silence Tour and Documentary Project, which is a 115 city spring summer tour. We've already completed a 36 city winter tour. And you've come clear from Louisiana, going through all of these cities, spending a couple of days or more, yeah. in each one doing what for the public? But what we do is um, we conduct research on the current needs of the community. Do that not only through the conferences, but we reach out to psychologists and universities uh, to help conduct the research, and that is basically trying to uh, assess the current needs of our communities because a lot of uh, programs on outdated stats. Uh, 90% of the victims don't tell. That doesn't mean you're going to get 90% to tell now today, uh, but more and more people are talking, and especially since we started the tour, we've noticed that it's almost like a ground swelling of people saying enough is enough. Um, on the second day, what we do is conduct interviews uh, for survivors across the nation. Not to say, woe is me, but to say, this is what has happened. It doesn't define us, and we heal through our faith, through our latest uh, healing modalities, and the most effective counseling techniques. So not only are we uh, conducting interviews for the documentary for survivor stories, but we're also filming uh, the latest healing modalities, uh, that whether that be Native American or neuroscience or um, whatever that entails or homeopathic because uh, people don't realize but you're especially with your health uh, good health is important especially for post-traumatic stress, stress disorder for people with anxiety and depression uh, because whenever your endorphins and your oxytocin and your uh, serotonin levels are at a higher higher rate um, you it's like when you exercise and you have these happy, happy endorphins going, and it makes you feel happier and you know more successful. And it's like when you accomplish things through your life, you or, or when you don't accomplish things that are the goals that you set for yourself, you have a tendency to uh, lower your self-esteem, and it just nicks away at your at your self-esteem, at your uh, self self value and your worth. And you think, you know, well, I can't accomplish this, and I've always failed, and you continue. So your health is important, your mental status is important, and so the, that's what we want to do. And also we found the latest and the most effective uh, counseling techniques, because many people go through counseling, or they've had a bad experience, and they refuse to go back. Uh, and we want to say it's not a one-size-fits-all. There are many different modalities that people can utilize, um, and some not so expensive. Uh, to just have an open mind and pick what's better for you. You know, all we do is present it. We don't, you know, make a judgment on which one's better or not. We just present it because everybody has different personalities. And as you as you travel across the nation, yes, and you take these surveys to find out what people need and how they need it and what's working and what's not, and what's happening and what's not. Do you commonly find a thread that runs through them all? Do you commonly find a mode of abuse or a modus operandi of a crime or personality behaviors of abusers or victims that seems to be repeating the same story or are they all so individually unique? Well, let me hold that thought. I'm going to finish. We conduct, and I'm going to tie this into the what you just asked. We also uh, host free public education prevention conferences across the nation. And we do that with local advocates, organizations, um, survivors, we've had everything from forensic psychologists to doctors to counselors 
uh, to advocate survivors to come and share their experience and their expertise and their stories. And the reason we do that, and to get to your question, is because we want to teach the local community leaders and the grandparents and parents how to be the frontline defense for their children and not dismiss the signs that happen in their home or in their communities or school, church, or because they're not just, um, they're not the stranger on the street mostly. They're people that are in your home, your parents, your relatives, a trusted neighbor, a trusted community leader. And what they do is they gain the tr the perpetrators gain the trust of either community or the families. Um, they have a very intricate network with other pedophiles and that teach them how to groom the children, how to appease the parents, and how to avoid the law. So when you're looking for a different or, or certain commonality, all pedophiles will have certain character traits, but they look like you and I. They, you can't just say, hey, you look like a dirty SOV. You can't say that because that's not true. Just because they look a little scruffy doesn't mean they're a pedophile. What determines a pedophile is, especially when somebody comes into your life and they're trying to give your child gifts, uh, a lot, a lot of gifts, or they're trying to uh, just make them feel special and, and you know, secluding them away from the other people. Well, what they do is they go in, especially for sing struggling single mothers. Uh, they'll go in and they'll offer services of babysitting, a Bible study, uh, money, uh, coaching, mentorship, you know, or fishing trips, you know, things like that. And then they continue to really try to gain your trust, and so they can come in, or especially while you're working. Uh, and they've offered the free babysitting. They have access to your children, whatever they can to do that, to get access to your children. But that also pertains to parents who are not involved with their children, and their children don't have a large circle of support and love. So these uh, perpetrators, like I said, they have a very intricate network, and that's the reason it's so important as we've gone across the nation to all these cities. We've been gathering uh, like an army of advocates because I think it's, you know, the perpetrators are very smart, and their network is very detailed, and they put a lot of time and work into deceiving the American public and the American government. So it's very vital that we set aside our, our egos, our territories, and we band together for a common good, which is fighting for child sexual assault and human trafficking victims, and giving them the voice they need, the tools and the resources. And so as we gain... Um, these, this group of army and advocates across the nation, we've also gathered the tools, the resources, creativity, and access to different funding that others have not considered. And that's the reason with our Boxer Foundation Virtual Expo, we're just trying to, it's not an umbrella group, you just come in as you want, you know, and we support you and we promote you across the nation because there are a lot of shelters being shut down. A lot of people are losing their government funding and they're having to go to private funding. And so we're trying to just offer different avenues because I promise you, as we all work together, then the children succeed. As we succeed, the children succeed. And that's what's the bottom line. So you find out what the needs of the community are, yeah. and you teach families how to deal with the whole situation from the beginning. That means recognizing the problem, seeing the signs of the problem, yeah. and carry it forth clear through to handling post-traumatic stress disorder and other psychological and emotional problems that come from being victimized. What we're doing is promoting hope and healing. Uh, we're delivering hope to a hurting world. And it's just so vital that, because it's, we may be leading this effort, but it's people like you and the different other advocates, it's all of our voices together, because I can't do it alone, we can't do it alone, you can't do it alone. We've already tried that. So it's time that we just, we band together and we fight for our kids. You mentioned that a person can't change anything if they don't recognize it or know what it is. You can't, if you can't change what you don't acknowledge. So if they start seeing the signs and understanding what they are, that's the first step towards solving the problem. That's correct. Uh, signs, especially if you have small children, um, recognizing the signs is important because you're providing a safer environment for your kids and you're reducing not only the trauma to the family, you're reducing the trauma to the child, you're reducing the cost for the community because once a child is affected through child sexual assault, um, they can get into cutting, they can get into drugs, the grades drop, they can get into promiscuity which causes uh, teen pregnancies and all of this will affect your education system because they may drop out and may not finish school. Uh, they get into trouble and they can't focus because they're so worried about just surviving. Um, that's going to make a great drop. If they 
get into self-loathing and anger and hatred of themselves because they wonder what in God's name do they do to call such a heinous crime against them. It's just that affects your mental health systems. Um, they try to they can commit suicide or try to commit suicide uh, with the low self-esteem. Then they're more targeted for bullying. Uh, so it's just very important to watch the warning signs. Warning signs would be uh, like a small child. A small child may have they may have crying fits, just crying outbursts. They may be afraid of a particular person, a particular place. Uh, they may have nightmares. Uh, they may have irritated genitals. They may have STDs. Um, they may be showing sexually inappropriate age um, activities like sticking toys up their cells or they may come up in their play with their dolls and their pets and their animals or in their art or if they're a little bit older with their music and their dance and their art um, and like I said they may get, us, get involved in cutting and things like that and so all these little signs are something that you really need to be keen for and when you see these signs you really need to call your local law enforcement and a lot of people don't trust them um, and a lot of times the kids won't tell until they reach a safety zone which is after they reach 18 or they ran away from home. Um, but you can call your local law enforcement. You can call the National Domestic Violence Hotline because like 39% of all families that have uh, child abuse are in a domestic violence situation. You can call the uh, local um, dating hotline if you're in an abusive dating relationship. You can call your local law enforcement or local CPS. And a lot of people are not too keen with the CPS, so they're usually called either one 800 number you can also, if you think somebody's in a domestic violence situation, which would adhere to the children as well, you need to ask them to do, like put a plan in a window or leave a window on at a certain time and that just shows that everything's okay and if that plant's gone or the light's off, that means that there's, you know, something's awry that they need to check on you. And those are just little signs you can do if you know somebody that's been, won't leave because a lot of times they're... Uh, self-esteem is just whirled away like water on a rock until they have nothing left. Um, and, and it's so all right because all these little signs come up when you're, you're dating somebody and you, and you think it's affection and they love you, uh, but if they start texting you a lot or if they start controlling where you go, what to do, uh, what to eat, who to talk to, they isolate you from your family, if they verbally and physically assault you or if they try to strangle you or uh, there's many other things. There, these are the signs that you can see when you're dating. These are red flags. And I promise you, abuse never gets better. It only gets worse. So when you're seeing these signs and you say, oh, yeah, he loves me. And you go on in this room. Those cute little things become very annoyances. And then you really realize how bad a problem is. And what happens is if you're usually finding that you're married to an abusive man, you can almost bet that he's going to abuse those children, sometimes physically and sexually. Or in a lot of times it could be a stepfather or it could be an uncle or a trusted neighbor or a priest or a teacher, a coach. Uh, it doesn't matter if you're in a small house or the White House. You know, nobody is exempt from justice. Um, and if you know somebody that's in this domestic violence situation and they're trying to decide if they're going to get out or not, ask them to put a safe bag, like a safe exit bag, where they can put like their, a copy of their driver's license, extra keys, Social security cards, uh, uh, medical records, insurance cards, things that they're going to need whenever they leave and have it in a safe place, even an extra toy, extra cash, a favorite toy of the kids and put it in a place so when you decide to leave, you can leave really fast. Um, and then I would just tell people who leave, uh, treat it like a bully system because when kids are bullied at school, we ask them to get a buddy system and that's vital because especially after the time you've left, that's the critical time that the, the perpetrator is mostly angry and likely to hurt you. So if you get a buddy system, and you, because we're creatures of habit, if you change your uh, your route to school or route to work, uh, change your passwords, change your uh, to post office box, find some safe place to stay. Um, and if you don't have a buddy that you can uh, go to carry to work or things like that, Call in and leave a voice message somewhere and just say, hey, I, I made it to work and it's such and such time on this date. Uh, and then when you leave, do the same thing and that way you have a record there. You know, and they also say uh, that the, uh, what is it, the, the warrants, the, the 
restraining orders. They really don't work uh, because if the perpetrator wants to get you, he doesn't, you know, these criminals don't adhere to the laws you were talking about earlier. So, but that's a vital record. It's like the same thing if your kids are hurt or if you've been hurt, go to the doctor and get that documented because that's going to uh, adhere to your case later. Write down a journal of all the incidences from the dates and the times because what happens, especially when you're under stress and you're trying to make a living and you're free for your life, you forget the details that are crucial to your case. So it's vital that you write down a journal of all the things that have happened and the times and the dates. And some, and even the smallest detail because sometimes you think, oh, well, I won't put that down, but that little bitty key can be the whole key to blow the whole case or to uh, make it stick. So, and that's what you want because you want your family safe and you want your community safe. And so it's, that's the reason when we talk about abusive dating relationships to teens, we ask them to really be careful who they bring into their family and who they bring into their home. What tips would you give to teens? What clues can you tell these kids so that they know who they shouldn't be associating with? Basically, we try to teach them to get a good support system. We, we have a, a program that I designed called the Fox of Defense Program. And we teach them about abusive dating relationships, and we mention the signs about texting. We met a group in North Carolina called OMRAP, and it was kids that were in the foster care system that had just gotten out, but they weren't old enough to get on the streets yet. So they're in this uh, this group called OMRAP, and I asked them, you know, if most of them had abusive parents and asked them if they thought they, they themselves were abusive and then, oh, no, 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 I said, let's break it down. I said, do you text your partner too much and are you controlling? Um, are you uh, isolate them from their friends and their family? Do you yell at them? Do you treat them and belittle them in front of their friends? Uh, all these little things like that. Um, and you can see their wheels turning because they're connecting their dots and they're seeing the behavior of their parents in them and themselves. And so that's how it becomes another multi-generational epidemic of abuse. So these kids, without realizing it, are copying, copying the only patterning of relationships they know. I'll never be like my mother and I'll never be like my father. What happens is when you start developing relationships, because that's your comfort zone, that's exactly what you look like. Not consciously, but subconsciously. So it's not until you develop the tools and the resources and the knowledge and maturity that you're able to develop healthy relationships that will sustain a lifetime. That's the reason a lot of the first marriages, they just don't work. And so we tell kids that and we tell them to take off the labels that the parents or whoever gave them that made them feel unloved and unwanted and cared for and rejected and unworthy. And to know that deep in their hearts, they know what God has made them and where they're headed in their life and what they would like to do. And they have the potential to do that and to just uh, believe in themselves and believe that despite all the things they've been through in their life, that there are great things they can still accomplish, you know, despite their faults, despite, despite mistakes, that we all have an inherent ability to fulfill our destiny. That's interesting that children do pick a mate like their parent of the opposite sex and they don't even realize it. Yeah, not so much physical features, but the way they interact with one another. The behavior patterns. Yes, behavior patterns. Interesting, isn't it? Yeah. And that's the reason we have to work to break the cycle. That's the reason we, we're doing this tour for the Higher Physical City Tour. We're trying to create a paradigm shift to break the social stigma of child sexual assault, to get people to not turn away in indifference. To recognize the signs and the water signs and solutions and to provide a safer environment for kids instead of saying, no, that didn't happen in my house or my, he would never do anything like that. So once you have the empowerment that you need, uh, it, it would just be a better role for our children, for our families. Uh, because once you break that trust for that child, they don't ever get that back. A lot of kids you can see who have been abused or in abusive homes they have a really deep, hollow look in their eyes. It's almost like, I call it the moth soul look. And so you have to really, uh, especially for teachers or community leaders, when you see things that are happening that if it smells like crap, it usually is crap. So you just really have to, you know, you can't put words in their mouth, but you can let them know that you're available for them. And, what, and since kids trust are broken by an adult, we have to continue telling them to 
talk to somebody and keep talking until somebody listens and somebody steps in on their behalf. Um, other than that, was there, you know, you say, tell a trusted adult. Well, hell, they don't trust adults. And that's the problem. And well, there's a key here when you're speaking, when you talk about the lost soul look and you talk about people turning away with indifference. If people turn away with indifference, and they do, why do they do that? Because, one, they don't want to get involved. Two, they think, it doesn't affect me, and I'm not going to get involved. Um, but it does affect you, because it costs states over $24.3 billion, according to the CDC, each year just to care for kids through the mental health system, through the education system, through the judicial system, just to, just to overcome the things, uh, you know, the side effects from the abuse, because uh, they're so traumatized, and they're mentally and physically held captive in that moment of time, because what happens is, if anybody has trauma, whether it be good child abuse, human trafficking, war, uh, on the job, or life experiences, whatever, you have, it alters, at that moment, whatever age they are, it alters their neural pathways of their brain, and until those processes are worked out through counseling, which many don't do, uh, or later through life's uh, through faith or human modalities, that moment in time, you know, will always be like their level of growth emotionally. I mean, they may grow up to be a, a man in a physical body, but their growth process is stalled, is installed at that at that age. And so you can't tell somebody, why don't you just forget it, or why don't you just get over it? Because they can't. Because their neural pathways have all been altered, and they have built new neural pathways that are keen to this trauma. And they were talking about, uh, especially people who have been through trauma, the child sexual assault, that there's a suicide gene. And they're saying that you can, and I haven't researched this, and so you can't quote me on this, but you can look it up. Um, but they're saying there's a suicide gene that is turned on whenever people go through child sexual assault and uh, the, the deep seated trauma. And what happens is whenever later, like when you're driving through down the road and you have the urge to run your car off the ditch or off the bridge or into oncoming traffic or you think about ways of killing yourself, that's because you've got this gene that's been turned on and you have to go through counseling. It's, and you can take a blood test and it will show up in the blood test. Um, but it's, uh, like I said, that's still in research and it's scientifically proven. But it, if you put it up to critics, you have some critics. Uh, but any, uh, uh, I can tell you just from my research, any kind of, any time somebody wants to conduct research, especially pharmaceutical companies or uh, big products, what they do is they uh, say they're going to do a blind study, but they cater to a certain um, uh, field of study or people that they can, uh, it's like a qualitative research. They get a certain people that will agree to their uh, to their what they're trying to prove and so you know I can't say that a lot of research is very uh, factual it is factual but it's it's like uh, it's very like, extensive is what you're saying uh, well no it's it just it is, is it is adhered to their agendas especially when pharmaceutical, pharmaceutical companies we use certain people that will uh, be more willing to buy their products or to say, yes, this product works. Um, and it's, it's like when they do a just a small selection of people, uh, a random study. When they do a random study and they say, they will they'll pick somebody that's more inclined to agree with them. So that's really not really good accurate research. A good accurate researcher will do a, a study where they have uh, product A and product B in it one doesn't work or you know it should come out and say so but when you have money and big pharmaceutical companies coming um, you're not going to get that and what they're going to do especially for doctors they'll continue to push treatments and drugs that um, are not beneficial for the community or the children and while schools say uh, we want a drug free zone they sit there and push Ritalin on kids uh, who have emotionally and uh, traumatic events that have happened in their life and you wonder why they act bad. It's because they're being abused at home or they're being traumatized or they're being beaten. And it's not so much that, and no, yes, they have a hard time focusing in school, but it's not that, it's 
like when you take a Claritin and the Claritin just puts in that foggy stage. That's what Ritalin does for these kids. And they, what, they don't, by the time they reach 18, it's not that they can just get off of it. Then they have to have something else to continue on that path to because you've altered their chemistry, their physical chemistry for so many years. You're going to have to continue that or wing them onto something different. And so you're just really dumbing down, numbing down a society that's, that will be easier to control. You mentioned when a person has trauma, yes, that their growth stops there. Did you mean their psychological, the psychological growth, growth, emotional growth, both, and, uh, physical, mental, uh, not physical, because you continue to still grow, and even psychological, you may, you may have, okay, like you have a tree, a tree gets a knot, the knot will be your trauma all the time, your abuse. You're still going to have growth around that, and you'll still have growth that will come out. And it'll look beautiful, and it'll appear like it's normal. But really, it is normal to say it's normal. But you still have this knot, and if you get some effect with termites and things like that, it's going to like rot the tree from inside out, and it'll affect all the little branches until they twist and they die. And that's what happens emotionally for victims. So even though you look good on the inside, you're dying, and you're how uh, infestations of trauma and the, sh the shards of the pain that will continue to cut you and bleed you until and it affects the way you trust people, it affects your relationships, it affects how you let people cross your boundaries and people, even the best of friends and the best of relationships will always continue to test one another and then see how far they can go and how far you're going to allow. So, and that's the reason the people who have low self esteem, you know, they'll sit like this, and it's not that they got I've been abused across their forehead, it's just that a perpetrator they can look at a crowd and see who has a low self esteem of it. If they're sitting like this, or um, if they're look, continually looking down, or, you know, if they have a low, meek voice, or, and there's many, many subtle signs. So, it's very important to work on your self esteem and know that you're valued and you're worth. You're, luck and that you respect it and even though people around you don't treat you like that you know deep inside what you have and if you have people in your life who are not treating you with respect and love then you need to find a good support system that does because i promise you the first thing perpetrators look like look for is somebody who does not have a good support system don't they also look for somebody that is powerless well, we all have power. Now, the perpetrators yes, make you feel like you have no power. True. And they feel like they, you've stolen all the power. And they'll beat you down to your self-esteem, not just physically, but the little way of saying, you know, you're too fat. You know, your hair is a mess today. Didn't you comment? Or why don't you look like that? Or, you know, what, you're eating too much. And, and it's not so much. And they're just continuing grinding day and day and day. So even the smartest and the educated people, you think, why don't they leave? And that's why. It's because they beat their self-esteem down and they're not going to leave because they they don't feel like they have any power. They don't feel like they have any control. Uh, they may not have those tools and the resources that were financial stability for their family. They may, like when I left with my children, they were 5 four, and one I had $300. I had no job, no place to go, no place to support. But I was bound and determined my children were not going to be raised in the same kind of home that I was raised in as a kid growing up. I just knew my children deserve a better life than that. And so um, it was hard, you know, and I worked long hours. But uh, they turned out to be really for all my kids. Isn't that wonderful? Yes, sir. <laughs> when you bring the things that you're bringing to this community, would you tell us how your program works when you bring it into your community? What do you do literally? What do you set up in the community? And how do you set the program out and deliver it and reach that community's needs? Well, first of all, when we go to each community, we reach out to the local news stations, radio stations, and churches to let them know that we're there. Uh, we also have to find a venue and we have to find speakers. Uh, and we do that first before we reach out to the public, the media. Uh, but what we do, whenever we conduct the research, we have uh, Dr. Kathy Mathis from the California Cognitive Behavioral Institute. Their team will do a data analysis and to help us uh, lay out what the needs have been extensively. 
uh, with our conferences, we also set up a Q&A question, and we ask uh, people, local advocates and community leaders, uh, what kind of red tape do you need to, um, what that stalls your and challenges you that you're not able to uh, be successful in getting the funding or successful in implementing the programs. And we've had uh, organizations talk about they have offer free programs. And even though they're free, the schools uh, won't allow them in there. And it's basically because, uh, for one thing, they get funding with different programs. Uh, they get a piece of the pie. Or if it's, um, and a lot of times they don't like you to come in and talk about sexual assault to their children because they don't want somebody to disclose and then they won't know what to do with them or who to report them to because we need more education of our judges so they can uh, make better judgments for the citizens. We need to educate more doctors. Uh, our law enforcement, our law enforcement will, especially if somebody sexually assaulted, they will say, like if a victim comes in and reports, what they'll do with this, uh, Dr. Rebecca Brown is conducting some research on uh, this toxic stuff, but you can look on our website or something. Um, but what happens is and she talks about when somebody's sexual assaulted or traumatized and there's like four chemicals that alter their brain pathways and it's almost like they're in a pod and so whenever they go in and they report it to the local police hi you know such and such right and so you're the police and you're going to say well you can't give me your story straight uh, you must be lying and you know if, if you can't do the facts one two three four or ABC then you must be lying. But what happens is, even in law enforcement, if somebody is in a shooting, they tell them like 48 hours because of the trauma of the incident and because you can't think clearly of what has just happened. So the police get to wait 48 hours before they're interrogated. Yes, that's right. But victims don't. And it's and what it is, it's like you have a bunch of public, like you're sexually assaulted. And it's what people have mentioned about floating the ceiling or disassociating their mind from their body because that's your mind's way of protecting you from what this trauma that's just happened. But what happens is it's almost like all the information is collected on little post-it notes of different sizes and they're stuck under the table or stuck in books and they're stuck all over the place. And then all of a sudden you're having to reformat that and you're telling, supposed to tell this place in chronological order all these bits of information and you're having trouble because you're still in a state of shock and you still are traumatized from the event so you can't think clearly and you can't give them accurate information and so what happens is a lot of times they will close the case because they think you're lying they will accuse them of lying so they're being re-victimized twice so they'll close the case and they won't have any paperwork to do and the victim says I'll never tell again so what we do with the, with the Q&A is we try to um, appoint uh, point people who will tackle these issues and then we contact them back in six weeks or so and see how's it, how it's going and what we need to do to help implement change and difference. Uh, with the documentary, we're hoping uh, to sell the documentary and I'm writing the book and we're hoping to sell that. Uh, the documentaries, the sales from that will be used for the Foxta Foundations all across the nation. Uh, and we would like to help them to any state. Uh, maybe more. Um, what they are is they will house, uh, it will have its own security, transportation, doctors, nurses. Uh, we'll have living quarters where the families of child sexual assault and trafficking. Uh, they'll have job training, self defense classes, um, counseling, everything they need right there to, uh, and we'll do it in a trimester stage because they need to detox from that toxic environment, from that abusive and controlling environment. And they need to learn uh, the empowerment tools that they have the power and they have skills and they that they're uh, not aware of and because people are so talented and you have God's giving you so many abilities that you just don't realize and so you tap into what they do good and then you're also providing counseling uh, you're providing job training you're giving them educational skills uh, and then whenever they get ready to graduate then you try to find them a home when they graduate from the program, you try to find a home that they can rent to own and uh, somebody that will uh, give them transportation or uh, you know, get a car cheaper or something like that. Because we, we don't want them going back on the streets. We want them to have the productive citizens who can provide for their families to stand on their own two feet, the business people to be educated people. Uh, because the key to breaking the silence and shattering the silence is prevention and education. So it's, that's the reason we go. Like I said, we're no 
all volunteer staff, we don't get paid. So, but we, you know, I found that this mission is so important that I mortgage my home because our kids are killing us. We are, the kids that are in our circle of influence, uh, they're clinging to hope. You know, there's some, my children die a day. So while most people are sleeping and eating, there's children who are actually dying due to abuse and rape and murder. So it's, you know, we just have a, an American statistic in our that's country. That's it. You can look it up on the Department of Justice. Our children die a day in our country from abuse. Abuse and abuse. That's, and I, you know, like I said, there's a lot of the stats, there's a lot of things you don't hear about. There's a lot of uh, murders where they're considered uh, an accident or something like that. So I think a lot of the stats are very underreported and underrated. And so, and that's what we're trying to conduct with your research is finding, get a feel of the pulse of America, see what's going on, see what we can all do to change it, not just us. So you're going to find out what a community needs? Yep. Find out what their personal needs are and sort of the statistics in the field of their area and the problems they have. Yep. Educate them on recognizing the problem and knowing what to do about the problem. That's right. And help them to solve their own problems with the wisdom and education that you'll make available to them. Yes. And all of these conferences are free, free to the public. So there's no excuse on why you can't come. That is really nice. Thank you. 
that he was a plan in the form, but to really be there present for the people. And when you treat people with respect, love, and the dignity they deserve, uh, whether you agree with them or not, you know, it's okay to disagree. Um, but when you treat people like the human race that we are, and not like the small-minded, the agendas that a lot of people have, uh, that's where you can really find a society that is more giving and more caring and loving, and that is nurturing their communities and nurturing their environment. And it's because of the hatred and the anger that all of our, you wonder what happens to these kids and how they're behaving so badly. But yet you don't stop and realize that they're being abused or they're being raped or they're being ganged or bullied. You know, uh, they're trying to be accepted to a gang and be bullied by either gang or people at school or just older peers. Even old people who say incredibly cruel things. All I ask is that you just be careful with your words because they hurt very much and you can't take them back. Um, and the kids are very delicate. I mean, they are very resilient, but they're also very delicate. Those scars that you don't see, they will grow up with them for the rest of their life. What I'm wondering, if I'm hearing you correctly, you're looking at, or are you looking at, the victim as caught in their lack of experience in life and whatever happened, and are you also looking at the perpetrator as the victim caught in his lack of experience in life and what's happened? You look at that because a lot of uh, victims, a lot of perpetrators have been uh, used but then there's some that are just pure. You, you hate to say some that are pure evil, but some even come from good homes, but they still have this anger and this hatred. So it's not just because they came from a music home. But I think with the uh, same thing with, the, with perpetrators, they need to have responsibility and accountability. Yes, it may be a drug and it may be an addiction, and uh, they always have to satiate that need, and it never gets better. It's only going to continue to be worse. But I think uh, you have to consider, despite what's wrong, they're still accountable and they're still responsible for their actions. And leaving kids on the street uh, to be around perpetrators or just because a mother needs the social economic status or she needs finances to raise her family or she needs a roof over her head. I don't think, uh, you know, I don't think that's right. You know, I don't, I'm not saying you want to blame an a, a abuse woman twice for staying because she has no other outlet. But two, you have to think that she's also accountable for her children. So, and, and that's kind of a, uh, a dichotomy right there because you don't want to blame her twice because she's a victim of the abuse as well, but still she goes over her children and she's responsible for them. So it takes a village to raise children, it really does. And we just work so hard. We give everything we've got. Um, we just want people to realize the value of children and the future that they hold for us. Because if you don't take care of your children, my George, they're definitely not going to take care of you when you get older. Well, today's children are tomorrow's nation. That's right. And if we don't teach those children, protect those children, guide those children, what is tomorrow's nation? So we're A bunch of wounded people. The, oh, that's tracking back at the world. That's, that's what, what we have. have. That's what we have right now. We just think if that continues, well, it's going to escalate too. That's the reason. If you want to do something, we need to do something now. If we want to make change, it's almost like you have a you have a small window of opportunity. If you want to change it before it gets too far, you need to join uh, your local organizations to help fight for our children. Join the Fox Foundation organization. You know, we'd love for you to join us. Uh, you can go to it's called F A C. Foundation.org, which uh, stands for Family and Friends Fighting Against Child Sexual Assault. We'd love for you to join us and help us fight across the nation, or just any other local advocate. You know, just do something today. Yeah, I mean, the children are counting on you, so do something today. I understand that you're going to have an educational format in Eureka that is tomorrow, which is April the 25th. And that will be at the Aquatic Center. And we invite everybody to come out because it is a free public education prevention conference. Uh, we'll have Rebecca Kimball on 
she will come and she will speak on her experiences and we'd love for you to come and see that. Uh, we'll have Annie O'Sullivan who has Can You Hear Me Now? She talks about the abuse that she experienced from her father. Uh, Kelly uh, Fair and she has a Mountain Goddess Unplugged and she's an emotional uh, motivator. So and you'll really like her uh, speech as well. But, and it, we're talking about the warning signs, the safe exit plans, the solutions. We give the community there, the tools and resources they need, and then we'll have a few and a questions uh, on what we can do to change our communities. I'm very glad to hear that, and with a little bit of luck, we're going to video that and put all of part of it on TV. We'll see how it goes. Wonderful. And I want to thank you so much for this interview and for enlightening the public and for letting them know that this program you're working on is a continued program that keeps going on in various cities in the United States to help us overcome our bad habit of ignoring the plight that's going on around us in sexual abuse. We're on a 115 city tour across the U.S. and Canada, and yes, it's for people not to turn away in difference. Um, and that's for anything. It's for us to become accountable and responsible. And to raise the bar, you know, and say, hey, you're much better than that. You can do better than that. So and we expect you to do better than that. And so we're counting on you. The children are counting on you. United States and Canada. Yes, ma'am. How far are we going in Canada? We're going to Calgary, um, Toronto, Quebec, Ontario, uh, Winnipeg. Wonderful. Yes, ma'am. Thank you, Connie Lee, for all you're doing. Thank you, Rebecca. For Thank you here. for coming to Eureka. We're honored to have you here. Thank you so much for your hospitality. You are very welcome. And I do hope you stay in touch and that all of the wonderful people in this community will be able to reach you on your website and to stay abreast and to follow the information, the scientific reports, the educational material that you will have available for them on this website. And please join us and we'll be glad to continue to keep you abreast of what's going on. Uh, for the challenges, we'll also have two petitions we'd like for you to look at on our website. One is no statute of limitations. Uh, the other is free DNA testing and processing for all children and child sexual assault. And I've done a lot of research with that and I've done some places that will fund that. Uh, you may have to do like a 1% sales tax, but it's sustainable uh, and it's doable. Uh, and we want some states already have no statute of limitations, but we want all states to have it. Uh, so we'd like for you to join that. We also have a million, million survivor march, and it's in Washington, D.C., uh, the Jefferson Memorial, September 28th and 29th. Uh, we'll have a silent march that morning. Uh, ask everybody to bring their t-shirts and say, uh, hi, my name is sexualist, and I'm a sexually assaulted at one age, or just decorate with your company logo, or any message you'd like to present. And we'll have a silent march across the Saito Basin, that's like a uh, mile and a quarter. Then we'll start up the rally, we'll have bands and cater food and uh, speakers from all across the nation. And that'll be a two-day event. And so we'll have the prize of the nation, and you don't want to miss that. Wonderful. Yes, ma'am. Wonderful. We thank you so much for sharing the education and making this a better world. Well, thank you so thank much. Thank you so much. God bless.